And lastly, there's a lot of excitement even in NASA and all, all, all agencies about citizen science. And, and, but the citizen science community, rather than looking at them as just disparate a collector of data and information to support big science, you know, we, we, we sort of create the same kind of platform to sort of engage the public because they are also trying to, uh, they're interested in getting involved in decision making process. So there's these three developments that we can uh, sort of leverage to create this kind of engagement that, that I think will, would be good for, you know, for science and politics to sort of help, help bridge the gap. So basically, you know, the, the next slide, you know, is how does natural scientists and social scientists and citizens kind of come together to work and create this space and models and sort of think outside of this kind of analytical framework that we sort of have been stuck with, and that's really not helping us uh, go where we need to go. Uh, next slide. So again, this is about CISPO. So this is, you know, we this is not all we do, but there's one part is that uh, we do this kind of engagement, and we do it this kind of engagement we know because this is actually good for science. It is good for public understanding. It is good for bridging the divide. Uh, so there. A uh, lot of programs that we have. Uh, I know we're running out of time, so uh, I'll be happy to talk about all of these programs, these platforms that we are trying to create to sort of get at this issue. Not only so, there's a set we were looking at from high school end to actually, in, in, you know, graduate education level, you know, about science and engineering education. How can we sort of build that reflexive capacity where, well, scientists actually can also think outside. A, you know all the parameters that also you know that's not just pure data and explanation driven but context driven and, and uh, obviously we talked about museum collaboration uh, there's uh, we uh, did this guy uh, uh, in the participatory technology assessment space we have sort of created a network and we're calling it expert and citizen assessment of science and technology cast network it's where we are leveraging uh, universities nonprofit think tanks and science museums to have conversations about complex issues. We had a uh, uh, had a citizen consultation meeting on biodiversity in four U.S. sites uh, in 2012 that was conveyed to the UN. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of options, but it's basically you know a call that uh, uh, John Arbor uh, made uh, in the early 2000s that uh, you know the social science of science policy needs to grow up and grow up quickly, and we're trying to help that by creating this platform by providing research and practice and, and a lot of avenue to have this kind of uh, pilot and experimentation. Thank you. I want to give an opportunity for people in the room to speak with um, with Dan and Mahmoud. CISPO has been around since 1999. I verified that with you earlier. I thought it was 2004, but that was when it went to Arizona State University. So the dialogue between science and policy has been going on for quite some time, and this is just one of the one of the groups that we feel will be bringing value to projects like CMS, but also to just science at, at NASA Goddard, and obviously we're engaging with other centers as we, we're making this uh, record um, to be on the website, and it's you know we're giving people online an opportunity to participate. But um, it's it's an effort for applications to to reach out and enrich with um, with science and decision makers. So. I'm going to give you the opportunity to speak with Dan. If there's people on the phone, um, you obviously won't have that chance. So if you have any questions on the phone um, that you would like to ask, feel free to go ahead and ask. So this is Mike Wright from uh, the uh, for the second speaker. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, all that really sounds uh, like a great approach as far as um, engagement in particular, uh, engagement with young people and uh, the public. Uh, I guess my question is, um, especially in light of recent reports regarding uh, the uh, what would be termed conservative media and uh, their, quote, attacks on science, how would a program like this even begin to compete with uh, more mainstream uh, media approach to challenging uh, science facts? The question was, um, what do you do about Fox News? <laughs> <laughs> you invite them. 
I mean, that's, that's what we, we try to do. One of the things we are trying to do uh, specifically, especially when we have this consultation, we had that with Worldwide Views on Biodiversity. So we actually try to keep the, you know, citizens, I mean, the quota of, you know, the Greens uh, to what it would be representative of the population. So we actually did a lot of canvassing, and so it's it's sort of building credibility. So yes, it's it's very hard. I mean, it's it's been a challenge, and we we find more uh, left leaning uh, uh, people in, in joining this kind of discussion. But uh, but it's it that doesn't mean that we just give up. I think it's it's just a matter of earning that trust and creating that platform. And we did, and we had an expert panel, and we tried to get. You know, conservative think tanks to actually help us with formulate the questions, and and we incorporated them. And and for us, it's not we're really not coming with an agenda here. We're creating that platform and letting the public value. So what it, it the more we do it, the more we can demonstrate how this can actually work. And and uh, I think it's it's a matter of trying and demonstrating and doing a lot of case studies. <coughs> And then uh, hopefully, you know, uh, that'll help uh, bring uh, the confidence that this is what uh, this is a conversation worth joining for everybody. Yeah. And quickly, one thing about it: we don't view the problem as science versus anti-science. We view it as a world where people have m different mental models about how the world works and how it ought to work. And this is the, our point is not a relativistic one. It's not that you know. If you don't believe in Newton's laws, you get to suspend them. It's that, it's that these are complex problems where values and facts um, come together in ways where you can, you can come up pretty much with any view that you would like that's reasonably well supported. So we try to be really agnostic and say we accept that there's different ways of looking at the world and different ways of, of, um, of acting in that world. But uh, science does not survive particularly well if it becomes associated with a particular ideological perspective. So, and just to give you one example, I mean, I think we've been pretty good at, at maintaining a neutral um, stance. We worked with, with John Marburger, who was uh, um, George H. Bush's science advisor during all the science wars, Republican war on science stuff. Um, we worked with Leon Cass, the head of the, their bioethics panel, when no other university would talk to them. Um, and that's so, so part of what we've tried to do is to really stay politically out of the fray and say all comers are welcome if you're willing to talk. Thank you. We are, um, we're going to hold all other questions. If you would like to send anything to Dan or Mahmood, please feel free to contact me. Um, we're going to wrap up the policy session, and if anybody in the room would like to stay after to speak, please do so. And um, this series is going to continue on. We're going to be repeating speakers or inviting different speakers about every six weeks, and we'll make an announcement through the CMS uh, community website. If you'd like to join, please again sign up in the back of the room, and we'll make sure to add you to our list. And we're also very open to um, to talks or topics that you're interested in, in hearing. So. Please let us know, and hopefully this was informative and you enjoyed the talk. Thanks so much.